Um, but thanks for joining us today. Um, and we are recording this session, so we will share this with you afterwards. So just to really introduce this session, it's probably been some time since many of you have experienced such profound change, such as the kind of change we've had in recent years. And we're now finding that managers at all levels are indeed becoming involved in implementing successful change strategies. We're really delighted to introduce you today to our three consultant guest speakers who will share with you some of the tools and thinking about success in transformational change. Before we begin, can I just um, advise you Hello. to drop questions into the question panel? Hello. Hello. Hello, who's speaking? We seem to, we seem to be having some uh, issues today. Can you all hear me? Can I just ask you to drop into the question panel that you can now hear me? Yes, we're, we're getting people can hear us now. So. Oh, right, OK. That's great, thanks. Well, what I'll do, I'll move rapidly on and introduce our three guest speakers that we have here today. So we've got Martin, who's got a very strong academic background with being an honorary professor at Kent with regular lecturing positions on the Kent MBA, including lecturing in maritime and air intermediate and the command course at the Defence Academy, Academy in Shrivenham. Martin is also an external PhD supervisor He's now the Chief Executive of Guided Systems Solutions Limited, with a wealth of management experience in public and private sectors, with over 15 years of execution of consulting activities for government departments, including the Ministry of Defence, the Department for Education and the Cabinet Office. Martin will be joined by Ian Kamak, who's worked in higher education since 1999, focusing predominantly mainly on project management and systems thinking. Ian has both directed and delivered award-bearing courses for the NHS, the UK Autonomic Energy Authority, and Health Hospice, as well as open programmes. Support systems include thinking initiatives in healthcare, communications, education, local government, and the charity sector. And certainly last but not least, you'll hear from Jim Scholes. Jim is the Chief Executive Lead Leadership and Tr Strategic Change LLP, and brings extensive experience in public and private sector, including UK central government and the computer sector. With over 30 years international management consulting experience in large complex multinational, he has supported organisations with growth strategy, organisational capability, leadership and change. And Jim has been an honorary professor at, um, at Lancaster University Management School for over 20 years, and has spoken and lectured in several countries and institutions with publications on systems, strategy and leadership. I'll now hand you over to Martin to begin the presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Julie. Um, and yeah, uh, apologies uh, to everyone for the uh, slight delay in the uh, beginning of this. So uh, uh, this, this slide really covers our understanding of uh, you and what you would like to get from this session. Uh, I won't read it out, but uh, thank you to everyone who completed the uh, questionnaire as you registered for this event. So collectively, um, we understand that you would like to focus on systems thinking and the practicalities of how to do change. We've put a lot of that in to this um, webinar. So this is really composed of lessons from our experience of conducting a whole lot of transformative projects, um, both in public and private sectors. And essentially what it's offering you is some possibility for um, your sort of you know, future direction. Essentially, if you if you can um, learn from anything that we've done as we've gone forward, uh, we would only be too delighted. Uh, on that note, I'll hand over to Jim, um, who's gonna talk you through systems. Good morning. Um, I'm sorry, we're running a wee bit uh, behind time, so I'm going to go at some pace through uh, some of this uh, material. But of course, uh, you will have copies available and it is being recorded, so I hope that's OK. Um, what I found is that the word system is in common usage, but uh, different people have different ideas about what it means. Um, so as you can see here, we tend to talk about system in very many uh, situations where perhaps it's about uh, trying to describe the world around us, trying to describe ourselves, or trying to describe things that we design and uh, implement, like uh, PA systems, power systems, and so forth. Much of what we're going to be 
talking about today is is more like um, the picture here of the educational uh, system. It's it's systems where uh, human activities shape what's going on, and indeed human activities are at the core of these systems. So that's pretty much what we'll talk about. Um, in relation to transformation, uh, systems, I think, provide a, a good way of, of framing the notion of, of, of transformation. So uh, for those who uh, would like it to be defined, for the purpose of this discussion, um, we're, we're picking up on the notion of a model of a whole entity characterized by emergent uh, uh, properties. And we're using systems ideas to describe how in a practical sense, we framed, designed, and managed a process of transformation in a, a range of organizations. Transformation, as you see the simple picture here, um, consists of going from some initial state through a process of transformation and emerging as, with some transformed state. In some sense, uh, transformation implies an existing dissatisfaction and wanting something better. If we look around us and look at uh, advertisements and so on, you can find ways to transform your home office from uh, what it is now to uh, the kind of lifestyle you'd love to have. You'll find ways, ad advertisements to transform your hair. Um, and uh, you can see uh, what the benefits of that might be, at least for some of us. Um, so transformation does in fact mean many things, but the core notion is an existing dissatisfaction and a desire for something better. So let's um, move on, Martin. And um, I, I'm not going to walk all the all through this and, and read out all the words. But what what I think it's important for participants to appreciate is that the lessons we're going to share today, the examples we're going to share, are not generic case studies. They're derived from actual work that we've been involved in, in, in doing. This is the kind of framework by which we've operated. It's a little bit like an action research framework. So we've used each of the interventions that we've been involved in. And between us, we've been involved in well over 100, maybe 200 interventions over several uh, decades. Each of those has provided some uh, level of learning about the nature of intervention and the nature of change. So what we've tried to do today is to give you uh, some distillation of some of the key points that we've learned. And hopefully that distillation will help you frame transformation challenges that you're likely to be involved in. So let's move on and uh, take a look at uh, one of the main things we found which is that the nature of transformation varies quite a lot across what we're describing here as a life cycle. In a commercial context, the life cycle might be thought of in terms of strategy, organizational strategy, or it might be thought of in terms of the business model uh, through which that, uh, which is delivered through that strategy. In the public sector, you can also see that uh, organizations go through the, this kind of uh, evolution over time. Growth needing renewal and perhaps needing uh, to be turned around. So you see a pretty much similar picture in both private and public sector. And we'll explore this in more detail as we go through. So we can start with a pretty simple illustration of a, a business model uh, transformation. Um, ask yourselves, what's the model here? This is a picture of uh, a, a petrol station in the countryside in the 1950s. And if we think about the environment in which this um, petrol station, this with uh, apparently prosperous owners, um, was operating at the time, it was a post-war period. There was economic growth. People were um, uh, in the countryside in particular, were getting more cars, motorcycles, and so on. They were becoming more mobile. So the few petrol stations that were around in the countryside probably uh, had uh, were able to uh, generate quite a good living. But what happened to that model? We know it looked very different a few years later. As you move into the 60s and 70s, um, the countryside filling stations started to look a little bit desolate. 
And there were several reasons for this. The, the economy had changed and there was much more choice available. Um, and uh, it's interesting if we look at how this had developed by, I think it was the year 2000, we'll see that the economics of this business had changed dramatically. Uh, for example, if we move on um, and look at uh, in what had happened by 2005, supermarkets were controlling uh, 10% of the UK filling stations, but we're actually selling 30% of the fuel in the UK. It started out pretty much with companies like Tesco and Sainsbury's and so forth as, as a lost leader, as a means of attracting customers in, into their um, uh, large uh, supermarkets. But even now, uh, if you go back one, uh, Martin, um, if even now, as we look at it, these the numbers have changed, and it's certainly true that uh, most of the supermarkets are getting some margin out of their fuel sale, sales now, but um, they've got uh, probably a larger share. And what we find if we move, move on is that as you look around, you can see that the nature of filling stations has changed. Um, the whole business model has changed. Their convenience stores, their news agents, their cafes, their florists, and so forth. So the point that I'm really trying to make here in relation to um, that uh, earlier uh, picture of how uh, business models evolve over time is that there is no static situation. You don't transform from something to something and it's done. In any industry, in any business, in any strategy, transformation is an ongoing challenge. The nature of the business model has changed dramatically over time and will continue to change uh, in future. So that's a very, very simple illustration. So if we move on from that simple illustration, I'll talk a little bit about what happened in the mobile communications industry. I did, I did quite a lot of work around this from the early 90s through to around 2000. So uh, it's an example I'm reasonably familiar with and it's not taken from uh, case studies. If you look at where Nokia was in 1992, um, just take a look at that one. Um, the whole Finnish economy was in pretty poor shape. Um, it was a major recession. Nokia was essentially bankrupt. The CEO uh, had committed suicide. The company was being uh, pretty much broken up um, uh, and uh, they had to decide what to do. And amongst the knowledge, the know-how, the assets they got was some investment in radio and communication. And that looked like a, a growth opportunity. So that's where they decided to focus their future. They divested other interests like uh, rubber uh, boots, uh, uh, tires, and uh, toilet paper. They were apparently number one in toilet paper in Ireland, but not a lot of people know that. So if we go back and look at what happened next, by 1995, they got a very clear focus on growing a mobile communications business. They used this uh, strategic architecture, which they subsequently showed or shared more widely in their annual report in 2000. This is something they created in 95. They, they reckoned they could grow a mobile communications business around this notion of humanizing technology, making it more accessible for everybody. They reckoned they could bring more features um, to the mobile device, so it's not just a phone. Um, it was a means, or it would become a means of, of sharing visual communication, photographs, uh, and so forth, and through integrating technologies. Um, so they, they couldn't possibly own all of the necessary technologies, but they figured they, they would become very good at integrating them. And if we look at where that took them to, we go back to the uh, earlier picture. Um, if we look at where that took them to, by the year 2000, um, they were looking at what comes next. What, what did they do to follow, follow up beyond this? And at that time, Nokia had come from uh, absolutely nowhere, a small Finnish company, to the world's um, fifth most valuable brand. That's how it was rated at this time. They were outperforming all of their direct competitors at that time, Motorola and Ericsson, 
uh, and um, they were uh, the darling of the investors. But you can't rest on your laurels. If we go back and look at what was happening um, by 2005, they were faced with a different kind of challenge because their growth was flattening out and they were wondering what would happen next uh, in this life cycle of mobile communications. Motorola had established the mobile business uh, pretty much over the decade of 1985 through 95. They focused on business units. Um, it was large and chunky technology that would probably last forever. Uh, it was high quality, but it was a relatively small market. Nokia um, looked at that model, couldn't really compete with it, but their view was that actually it should be a consumer offering, handsets for all. Uh, rather than just for businesses. It would be a fashion item, it would be more than a phone. And they built significant capabilities in their supply chain, new product development, and the brand, and so forth, which was what underpinned the success that I've described. But by 2005, um, the question was, uh, Martin, if we could go on to the next uh, line, that's it. Uh, by 2005, and this slide actually is from 2004-05, it's a, a discussion that took place with Nokia, the question seemed to be, what's it going to take to become the preferred consumer interface? Because it's not all about the device, it's not all about the phone. Um, so different kinds of competitors were recognized at that stage. Some were taken more seriously than others. Samsung could obviously do uh, mass production of the devices. Um, uh, players like Vodafone had um, a lot of access to the users, to the customers. Um, Google was looked at as pretty much an outsider at that uh, that time, although they obviously, obviously their search capability was important. Apple was known for iPods rather than um, mobile communications. So very unclear. Nokia's challenge, uh, if you press on the next button, uh, Martin, Nokia's challenge was how do you take something that is extraordinarily successful at that time and change it to the next generation of strategy. In some sense, it's probably easier to be an entrepreneur. It's probably easier if you're coming in as Apple into a new space rather than trying to tune an existing successful model and make it something different. And we know with the benefit of hindsight that Nokia didn't do a great job here. So if we move on, um, Martin, um, what we found, and I think this is probably one of the key takeaways for you folks, because I don't know what challenges you're dealing with. The key message here is that renewal, what we've described here is renewal of any well-established organization or strategy is always the most difficult transformation. The notion of revival or turnaround is it's always challenging, it's very difficult, uh, it's emotionally difficult uh, when a company is in or an organization is in very poor shape, but the problem is relatively easy to define. And a lot of people uh, share that context and, and have a motivation to do something about it. What we've described as reinvigoration, which is uh, you know a stage that I, I touched on with, with Nokia, um, is is challenging in an intellectual sense it's challenging in a resource sense it's looking for options but again um, there's not the same level of urgency by the time you get to renewal you're dealing with a problem situation where there's relatively little uh, shared context and the challenge itself is quite complex there's no shared view of a good outcome so that's that's the most uh, difficult thing so Bear that in mind, when you talk about transformation in your context, what stage is it at? What are you actually dealing with? Martin, I think possibly you want to pick up here. That's great, thanks Jim. Yeah, and um, this is what I'm gonna talk through here is a piece of work that was done some years ago. Both Jim and I are talking about slightly um, sort of uh, older uh, work because obviously we can't share uh, sort of other people's IP uh, on current projects. Uh, the Nokia case is fine and um, this one is fine because it's it's slightly older. So this this builds on that um, 
that sort of systems approach to um, transformation, systems approach to, to making a real significant difference to a, a real uh, system. So this is an example from the public sector, and uh, this is about the reserves. So people who are part-time um, sort of soldiers, uh, sailors, or um, or uh, air people, and um, the, the challenge was in 2014, what do you do about that pink line? There'd been vast amounts of money spent um, on trying to uh, get the reserve uh, train strength numbers up. So the people who've actually been through completed training and are able to be deployed. Um, and that line was pretty much flat. Um, there'd been a whole lot of work done on that from 2010 onwards, vast amounts of advertising money had been spent. The big question was, how do you get there? How do you get to this target? What do you do about it? And it was a classic systems problem. In the background, we were applying a model called the viable system model. I won't uh, go into huge detail on that because of time here, um, but essentially there was quite a lot of systems thinking being applied to this. Uh, in the, the viable system model, what you consider is um, essentially the management and the operation system and how you can make this work as an entity uh, overall. So this is really taking the, the heart of systems thinking as, a, as an approach to improve the way that a real system is working. I won't go into great detail here, but basically what you're doing is you're, you're advertising. So this is like any web-based business. You've got a, a sort of um, web-based front end. You've got some real tangible um, sort of you know, activities going on in terms of eligibility checking, um, selection and training recruit, recruits, then ultimately maintaining the train strength. So t keeping those people who were reservists uh, in sort of um, uh, uh, trained and motivated to continue to work with the system. The meta system, so this means the, means the management system, this means the, the, uh, the, the entity that is controlling the operations. The meta system needs a vision, it needs a strategy, it needs some decision making, but really, really critically, um, it needs the right management information to make those decisions. And it needs essentially the direction. So, um, you know, it says the rule book here, uh, this is a, you know, it's a very military system, but um, this exactly the same approach applies to the private sector, so that rule book just may be direction from uh, you know one of the directors or the, the senior managers um, in this case it really meant the rule book um, and then of course there's uh, a third component so you've got management you've got operations but you've also got the environment and the environment's a really really complicated place the environment is full of people uh, and people can you know behave in all sorts of different ways some in this case are perhaps um, you know interested in joining the reserves and some are absolutely not like the uh, the man on the right so the the environment is very complicated and you have to understand the environment well. When we started to unpick uh, what was going on in the reserve system in 2014, um, actually everybody was re working really hard. It was a system characterized by the fact that um, you know, the, the individuals within it uh, were all doing um, quite a good job within their own kind of stovepipe. And the issue was, um, how do you get them to work uh, across this as a whole system? And one example of this was um, the, the targeting of the advertising campaign. So they were essentially targeting at what's known as the core intenders, Group A. Um, there was a very small number of those in relative terms uh, in the system. And when you just did some simple stuff, like you said, okay, great, let's assume you're 100% successful. Let's assume all of that target population uh, is wooed by your advertising campaign um, and uh, signs up. If you applied the level of losses to this system that there were um, back in 2014, and all these numbers have been published, this is a case that's been freely um, sort of uh, published by the, um, the public sector. So uh, if you applied all of them into the system, you applied the uh, loss rates to it, you ended up with uh, less than 900 in the train strength. It was nowhere near enough. So this was one of uh, many uh, um, charts that I used to convince the seniors that actually their approach was, um, you know, was really not going to work. You had to make some really significant changes to that as a whole um, to, to make, it, uh, make it work. And some of those changes were around the information management. Some of them were around uh, the way in which uh, each uh, part of the system was uh, rewarded for what it was doing. Um, and essentially what that meant was that we had a whole system approach to uh, a Get Well program. Um, and again, there's, there's not time this morning to cover this in huge detail. 
Um, but it's, uh, it's it's probably the only piece of consultancy where there's been a um, sort of a, a formal record kept over years as to what happened. So the first thing that happened is you've got a fairly linear uh, rise once the um, recommendations were accepted by the Secretary of State for Defence. And that, that sort of led to a rise that probably would, if it had continued, just about have met the, um, the, the target um, in uh, 2019. But the... Um, of course, that, that rise then sort of rolled off and what you needed to do was a refresh, go and retarget and reinvigorate the system. Um, instead of refreshing, what they did in, in fact was, you know, I wasn't involved in that at this stage, they, they basically changed the definition of train strength, which got them another big sort of step towards um, you know, towards their goal. Um, that's then, then then the sort of the line sort of fit, rolls, rolls off again. Um, and again, a, a refresh would probably have uh, helped to actually hit the target. So they weren't too far away from the target. So, so it's... it's uh, Actually, a way of being able to um, uh, enhance and, and, and improve your your system. Some people would have looked at this as a numbers game. It's just about numbers. It's about how can you can you do that. But actually, what you had to do was you had to change the system far more fundamentally than that. Um, and it, it goes back to Jim's point about change. You know, transformation is not static. It's ongoing. It's continual. Um, and what we have to do is is learn about you know the way in which that system works. And we're continually learning about the system uh, as um, you know, Google are, for example, in terms of uh, you know, being able to, to learn about you know, what we're all searching for. So that continual learning process is massively important and that continual transformation process uh, needs, needs to happen um, uh, as, a, as a whole system approach. So essentially, these, there's, there's a few um, sort of notes that we've put together here, which are based on um, the uh, our, our um, sort of view as, as to what, what it takes. And again, I, I won't read all of these out, um, but these are some of the preconditions for uh, success. So at the outset, what has to be in place in order for a transformation to stand a reasonable chance of, um, of, of, of sort of making it through? And I think I'd, I'd just um, you know, mention just the, the first couple of points. If you haven't got engagement from those at the top of an organization, then your chances are very, very minimal at actually making a, a difference. So you do need um, the, the senior people engaged. You need them to um, sort of actually put time into this, not simply um, sort of you know make a pronouncement and then move on. It's really important that uh, you have that uh, that level of engagement. And the, these are things that uh, if you don't have at the beginning, then you, you're probably going to struggle. And um, as we move forward through the transformation, um, these are some of the potential pitfalls that um, we've we've discovered. Uh, and again, I won't read them all out. Uh, the slide pack is uh, available to you, so you're welcome to uh, have a copy of this. Um, again, one of the things that sort of comes to, 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 to bite is lack of motivation, um, particularly when people realize that uh, you know the change is affecting them. Bill Clinton used to say that everyone was for, for change in general, but against it in particular when uh, they realized that they themselves have to change. And it's really true, maintaining that sort of motivation on changing when things are getting difficult, encouraging the CEO just to keep on going, uh, despite the fact that uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of issues from within the organization. Um, that's, that's another uh, really um, important um, sort of point to, uh, to make. So uh, then as we uh, move on to really the conclusion of, uh, of, of today's session and we move towards questions, um, I think I'll just reiterate um, sort of Jim's um, point about this being about an initial state um, and then a transformed state. So a dissatisfaction with an initial state. And, you know, there can be a lot of dissatisfaction around, which doesn't necessarily lead to transformation. Um, you know, people can be dissatisfied with, uh, you know, with, with, with their environment, with their work for a quite long time before they, they make changes to it, uh, whereas others are more proactive. So the dissatisfaction doesn't necessarily lead to transformation, but it's, it's an ingredient that might um, get people through a transformation process. Um, and what we can do is, uh, if we view this as an ongoing um, sort of situation, then we can we can sort of take that that sort of simple model of initial state transformation, transform state, and look at it as a, as an ongoing process where we essentially put some monitoring in. It's really important to monitor, um, you know, what's going on, how that transformation is progressing, uh, how are we meeting, you know, the requirements. Um, we want to make sure it's not, you know, requirements of, you know, last year or perhaps even last month in a dynamic industry, but it's the requirements of today. Are we really meeting today's requirements and the requirements of the future through that transformation process or have things moved on?
is the environment changed? Has um, have have things become uh, sort of different? So that that's really a, a, I think a key key uh, sort of slide to, to keep in mind in terms of the fact that it is an ongoing uh, activity and it is something that um, you know is is worth uh, sort of paying attention to as a as an ongoing um, piece. So we have the um, slide pack on this. This will be available to you, um, and we've got the um, sort of access to a canvas, which is uh, essentially a video capturing uh, sort of the key points here that uh, Ian and Jim have, have animated. So again, we'll, we'll make that available to you um, at the end, um, and we can we can now uh, move to questions. We've sort of sped things up a little bit just in view of time, just to allow for uh, you know people to have that sort of opportunity to to kind of ask us some some questions. So um, I'll. I'll uh, hand over to Ian. Uh, Ian, is there, uh, have, you, have you got some some questions uh, in the in the system at the moment? Thanks very much for that, Martin. Um, still awaiting some some questions. Um, we're just getting the first one through now from from Hillary. Um, and the back question is, how do you or do you differentiate transformation from change? That's an interesting question, Jim. Jim, do you want to come in on that one, or shall I? Well, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's an excellent question. I mean, change, change of course, is on, ongoing. I, I think if, if I'm trying to define it uh, on the fly or differentiate it, um, I would say that transformation, at least in the sense that we're talking about it here, is a deliberate or a purposeful attempt to, to change from a situation that is generally regarded as unsatisfactory for specific reasons to a situation that is generally regarded as better against some specific criteria. Um, so, yeah, change is ongoing. We can't control all change, that's for sure. Um, but transformation in an organizational sense is something that I think we're arguing um, should be undertaken purposefully one needs to be clear about the starting position and where one is trying to get to. I hope that uh, uh, meets the question. Okay, thank you. And um, Alan's asked an interesting question about how do you actually identify the system boundaries? Well, Jim, do you want, do you want to well I was going to suggest you have a go, Martin. Sure. OK. Um, boundaries are always an interesting uh, question because um, they, the bounds of, of many systems are you know, far reaching. Um, and I think one of the key things to look at is um, sort of what do the key stakeholders believe that the, the boundaries of the system are? And um, you know where where would 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 the logical sort of um, effect of your your transformation sort of take effect? Uh, and and does does that seem to stack up? Does does the logical effect of your your change, your transformation, etc., seem to align with what your stakeholders believe um, is the boundary of the system? Uh, and and often it doesn't. I mean, certainly in the case of the um, the, the reserve system, the stakeholders' uh, view of the boundary was it's about numbers. It's about you know it's about my part of the system and that's it that's all I have to do um, whereas uh, of course the, the the boundary of the system was much much wider um, so I think as a as a consultant you have to have you, your view of a boundary and you often have to bring the stakeholders along with you uh, in that discussion of is this a reasonable view of the boundary Jim do you want to do you want to pick up on that um, maybe just make a slightly different point because it, it in reality i think as we all know this is a really tricky and important um question i think um you know in a commercial context uh, one of the things one finds is that um what are often described as industry boundaries you know what is the computer industry where is its boundary they they really do need to be uh, challenged because certainly in um industries that are characterized by technology and rapid change, the boundaries are always changing. Um, what one finds is that uh, industries uh, converge, collide, different kinds of companies um, uh, get involved, and they, they have different 
uh, business models and different aspirations. Um, rather than spend a lot of a lot of time on it, I would go back to the uh, slide, the Nokia slide earlier on, on the kind of um, three generations of uh, uh, mobile comms. Um, and if we look at it, I think what's kind of interesting is when we got to uh, 2005, and not not that one, but uh, move on to move move on to the next slide. Next slide. Uh, that's it. That's it. Leave it there. If you move on to 2005, what you can, what you can see, what we try to picture there is that the the players at that stage in, in the industry development were coming from outside of making handsets, making mobile handsets. Google was coming from a totally different position. Samsung was a broad-based uh, industrial enterprise. Apple was coming from, you know, fooling around with music and consumer products. Vodafone was coming from elsewhere. So the, the point that I would make is that they would each have a diff different description of the boundaries, but that was the space that Nokia was playing in. And it was the boundaries or the concept of their industry that um, in some sense probably held back uh, the progress that they were able to make at that stage. They were self-imposed boundaries based on their history rather than uh, a future view. I hope that makes sense. Okay, thank you, Jim. We've got a, a question from, from Kevy and one from Fiona. And that's, you know, how do you support employees through change? Or how do you motivate people to engage with the transformation? So, shall I? I mean, I can. I'll, I'll, I'll very happily um, sort of you know, start uh, this, and uh, Jim, feel free to to, to contribute. Um, so, there's. I think that there's, there's a lot that we can do to um, to sort of help people through um, through change. And um, I think one of the key things to think about uh, is the Kubler-Ross change curve. Uh, I don't know whether people are familiar with this, but uh, it was a, a piece of work that uh, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross did on essentially people who had been given a um, terminal diagnosis. Uh, and I think Elizabeth Kubler-Ross is probably the only person who, who actually says that it, it's only valid for people who are given a terminal diagnosis. But a lot of people use this in um, sort of helping people through uh, through change and, and essentially the, the different stages are you know shock at the beginning so for example uh, you know let's let's take a, a classic corporate example if you're if, if, if people are asked to move office there's initially that kind of well I don't want to move there it's it's the other side of town or it's it's the city or it's you know it's it's um, you know three hours commute away or wherever it is there's this, this initial no way not on earth not in a million years then the, the, the next stage is denial um, people will you know deny um, you know disbelieve and I've um, I've, I've led uh, sort of change activities where uh, people have gone on denying till literally the removal van arrives to collect their stuff and they're still in denial. They're saying, oh, it's never going to happen, but the removal van's here, it is happening, you're going. Um, then the next stage after that is frustration. Um, people get um, you know, really uh, sort of angry, upset, um, and um, you know, that, that's that's just a stage. After that become a, becomes depression and ultimately then acceptance. Um, and so I think the key thing about Kubler-Ross and you know, there are many models of the way that people change and the way people people evolve. But I think the key thing is you can't simply go from shock to acceptance. Um, and no one can. We, we, are, we are all human and we will all go through those stages, uh, unless it's, of course, something that doesn't matter. I mean, if it's the changing of stationary order, who cares? You know, we're not going to go through that. But if it's something that deeply matters to us, like the place where we work or uh, you know, the place where we live, if we've got to move our uh, home, etc., cetera, those, those sorts of changes um, you know, will naturally elicit that sort of response. And so what I, I think is important in helping people through that journey of change is to um, really focus on the next Next stage, if they're in shock, um, you know, what what evidence is that? How can we help them through sort of the the kind of denial and frustration part? Um, what happens when they they get depressed? How can we sort of help to offer them? Hey, there's some interesting work here. There's some fun stuff. There's some great people to work with, etc. And ultimately, how do we help them to acceptance? So it's about planning and and helping to navigate that journey for employees. Jim, do you want to do you want to come in on that? Yeah, I'll just add a couple of points, maybe, and I, I think it was implicit in what um, Martin's been saying. But for, for me, the I'd reframe the question a little bit, if I if I if I may. Um, it's not always about helping; it's sometimes about challenging. I think 
the, the most important thing is you've got to figure out how do you engage people in, in a way that's constructive. And um, in the kind of work I've been involved in over the years, which is essentially um, strategy, uh, strategic change, you know, one of the things that we found, which is rather different to most traditional consulting thinking about strategy, is that strategy can't be, really be brought in from outside and be implemented. This is one of the challenges uh, facing government, of course. If people are not engaged in strategy, if they don't understand it, if, they, if it's beyond their capabilities, it probably won't be implemented. And the, the question for leaders, and I think for uh, those of you working as consultants, is how do you engage people in a meaningful way in the creation of their future possibilities? They won't make all the choices, but how do you, how do you engage them in exploring and challenging the, the organization as a whole? Now, this, this can be done, and this is uh, pretty much what was behind the um, the growth period in uh, Nokia's development from 95 through till 2005. So in that picture, we can look back at, and I, you know, I think what we've all learned at least is that the extent to which you can engage people in a meaningful way in the creation of um, uh, possible futures that really determines the likelihood that you will both come out with. Uh, worthwhile transformation and uh, transformation ideas and transformation that's actually implemented. So just a, a slight nuance may be, um, I'm, I'm not negative about helping people, but it's, it's not help from on high. It's simply giving people the opportunity to be engaged and giving them the structures and processes that allow them to be engaged. It's not simply a communication exercise. Thank you, Jim. I think that echoes Alan's uh, question about how you actually get the, the ostrich to get its head out of the sand. Um, but Alan goes on to also ask about you know, how do we understand the external influences on the system? Yeah, yeah. I mean, one of the um, one of my erstwhile colleagues had a great phrase, which was more often than not. Um, the uh, the stopper is at the top of the bottle, me meaning um, the problem isn't people deeper down in the organisation. The problem is how do you unblock the blockage at the top? And um, as an out as a consultant, I think one of the challenges is how do you provide enough protection for people in the organization, and that is a form of help. How do you provide enough protection for them to take a case for significant change to the people above them? It's reversing the logic that you typically see. And it, and it was the case of, I'll just give you a very quick, for example, I'm, I'm mindful we'll run out of time shortly, but in that uh, Nokia picture, the, the strategic architecture was something that was created by people in the organization and basically taken to the top and adopted by those at the top. It started off with a group of about 20 people from memory, expanded out to something like 60 people. People actually wanted to work on it. It was a, they saw it as a worthwhile investment at that time. And they were given enough protection to take it to the top management team and to the board. And um, that's a kind of reversing of the usual logic. The assumption in most cases is that strategy comes from the top, but um, you know, no one person at the top of a company in a rapidly changing industry is likely to have a complete vision of the future. I would also add it's it's worth looking at some of the motivations in the system as well. People are, um, as, as you described, as ostriches. Um, I, I always think about um, sort of camels and racehorses. So camels are quite negatively motivated. Um, racehorses are quite positively motivated. So, um, you know, what, what is their true motivation? Um, and I've, I've got a long way, you know, sometimes by just helping people away from what it is that they most fear. Um, 
you know, that's, that can be quite a useful thing. So it's worth looking at, you know, where the true motivations are for some of those senior people, as well as the people who are helping them to make the decisions. Um, but it's, it's a really good point, um, Jim, about the um, sort of helping to uh, help the people below the seniors to, 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 to take that forward. I'm keen just to ask a couple of questions, if I may, um, just of, uh, of, of the audience. Um, we, we could offer a follow-up uh, session um, at, uh, in, uh, at a number of different locations. I just wonder whether uh, people would be kind enough just to type a few things. If you're, if you're at all interested in um, having a sort of follow-up session, it would be great just to know where your preferred location would be. Um, would it be London, north of the country, elsewhere? Um, you know, just again, if, you, if you'd like to hear more from us we're we're very happy to to run another session um, and also if I could ask you please um, just to sort of add in some um, into the notes that if, if you would have an ideal sort of situation uh, would it would you like a sort of an intro um, would you like an intermediate session or a master class on this uh, again we'll you know we'll gladly do uh, anything that's useful for you know for for the audience so um, if I could just uh, just ask, ask for ask you just to sort of type a few things into the um, questions area uh, and Ian will, will pick those up as, as, as we go while you're typing uh, is there anything else that we want to want to pick up as a question Ian do you want to, is there anything else that you've you've spotted We've got the last question about, about whether is a new rail development um, operating as a system. So, so possibly that's connected to HS2. So would you regard that as a as a systems development? HS2. Um, it's a it's a very interesting question. Um, you know, there's there's one of one of the issues with large government projects is that um, there are a great many people who uh, sort of claim kind of to, to, to be directing and um, you know uh, adjusting the course of that, you know, the course of, of these big projects so uh, I think if you were to analyze this in terms of you know was it a beautifully executed um, project you know applied with perfect systems thinking probably not um, but it is a classic government project which has uh, quite a lot of political interest in it let's let's put it that way do you, Jim, do you want to do you want to comment on HS2 more? Uh, not really. I'm not an expert on HS2, but but I can certainly uh, concur with um, you know the the general comment about very large um, public sector projects because um, they stir up uh, quite a lot in the political domain. They stir up quite a lot of emotion. It's not all about rationality and numbers, and um, we probably don't have time. For, uh, for the, the debate right now, but I certainly wouldn't regard it as a system, which is the question asked um, in any design sense. Um, but I would argue quite strongly that you could beneficially use systems thinking to help you uh, come up with a, a rather better approach to HS2 than has been evidenced so far. Excellent. Thanks, Jim. So. Um, Thank you very much, everyone, for uh, for your questions. Um, thanks for joining us uh, this morning. Uh, we will make available the the presentation material and, of course, the video that I mentioned uh, at the uh, a little later on that will all be sent out to you. Hi. Okay. And and just to finish by saying thanks very much, everybody, for joining us today. Um, apologies for the slight technical hiccups at the start. Um, and in the usual way, we'll follow on with the um, the, the recording of this event. And of course, the feedback sheets where, again, you'll be able to indicate if you'd be interested in a more detailed session where you'll be able to catch, capture those real tools and techniques to help you with your transformational change. And thanks, importantly, to our three presenters for your time today. Uh, we really do very much um, appreciate you taking the time to do this session for us today. Thanks very much, everybody, and goodbye. Thanks, Julie. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.